everyone, and welcome to another edition of Sustaining Sustainability. I'm your host, C.B. Bhattacharya, Professor and Director of the Center for Sustainable Business at the University of Pittsburgh. Today, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by Jack Azaguri, who is the Senior Managing Director and Accenture's Market Unit Lead for the U.S. Northeast. Jack joins us from New York City today, and he's responsible for clients, people, offices, community involvement, and financial performance across the region. He has had a 25 year plus distinguished career at Accenture. Today, leading more than 10,000 people in the Northeast, Jack focuses on bringing continuous innovation to clients, attracting and retaining top talent and strengthening Accenture's impact in the local communities. Prior to joining Accenture, he worked on strategy and business development in the software industry in the United Kingdom, United States, and Japan. Jack, welcome to the show. CB, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to have you and thank you as well for Accenture's support of the Center for Sustainable Business for our listeners. Accenture is the 12th company to have joined the Center for Sustainable Business as a corporate sponsor. So thank you. Thank you. It's uh, the work that the center does is uh, invaluable and uh, we, uh, we're a proud sponsor. So thank you. So Jack, before we dive into big questions, could you begin by telling us about the why behind your own professional journey to become the U.S. Northeast market lead at Accenture? How would you define your personal purpose? I would say if I, if I think about personal purpose, I think to me, um, it starts with our people. And, you know, it's a fundamental principle, you know, if you treat your people well, good things happen, uh, great things happen, actually. And uh, for me, it's always been about, you know, we, I, you will read a lot of business literature and what is the attribute of a great leader. And to me, just being a good person and treating people the way you would like to be treated is often an, uh, underrated and, in, in my view, the most critical uh, leadership attribute. And I, and I try to do my best in that dimension. And with that comes, you know, making sure our, all our people feel, you know, we, we like to use the expression at Accenture, seen, uh, safe, connected, and courageous. Safe, seen, connected, and courageous. And that, to me, is, is a passion of mine, making sure we build the right team and that everybody feels at home at Accenture and, and they feel that they're treated like family, supported like you supported in a family. And uh, with that comes including in diverse, inclusion and diversity. You cannot create the right work environment and have people treated in the right way if you're not passionate about inclusion and diversity. Uh, it's been a big focus of the firm uh, and of myself. And, uh, you know, we want people to bring their whole selves to work. And so, um, Mm -hmm. You know, that, that if I had to answer right now, that, that would be uh, what I would talk about in terms of my own personal uh, purpose and what gives me a drive every day. Excellent. Excellent. Now, continuing the focus on purpose, what would you say is the purpose of Accenture today? And, and uh, how does that guide the work you do and decide not to do, uh, such as Accenture's participation, uh, very impressive participation, I should add, in the COP26 activities? Yeah, so, so our, our purpose, if you go to our website, our purpose is to deliver on the promise of technology and human ingenuity. And there, there are a few critical words. One is to deliver. We are very focused on delivering outcomes for our clients and results, uh, not PowerPoints or reports, but actual outcomes and results. Uh, technology and human ingenuity are the two key components that really help in, in every project we do. And whether it includes sustainability or implementing a piece of technology or a corporate strategy. Uh, if you then dig deeper into a core element of our strategy, it's really, we call it delivering 360 value to a client. So delivering value to client is, is not just about financial results. It's about how did we help grow their employees? How did we help them with diversity? How did we help them with their environmental and sustainability goal? How did we help them with their operational goals? And we aim to measure all our relationships by what value we've created across all those dimensions. Now, if we, if we um, uh, talk about sustainability, 
you know, it's always been a, a focus for us, but I would say, um, you know, over the last few years, it has certainly intensified under Judy Sweet's uh, leadership. You know, we, we had a strategy in 2013 in our techno- annual technology re- report. We said every business is going to be a digital business in 2013. And people said, you know, that that's just hype. It's not going to happen. And I think if you ask most companies today, do they have to be digital? It's digital critical. They would say, well, of course, mm-hmm. of course it is. Mm-hmm. This year, Judy said by 2025, every business is going to be a sustainable business. And I think if you ask a lot of companies that say that's probably just like they told us in 2013 with digital, they probably say oh, 2025, every business is a sustainable business. That that's That's hype. And I really believe that to be the case. And I think we'll be proven right. I think the imperative around sustainability is going to have to be a core part of every business that wants to be successful. The transformation that we have to undergo uh, is just critical. And and Judy calls sustainability the next digital. And I I really, when I look at the journey we all have to make as leaders in in the community and in corporations, it is critical. I I will tell you, for example, we've, we've been working on our you know, metrics, it's the start of our fiscal year in September for all our 8,000 plus managing directors. Sustainability is one of five pillars that all our MDs have to consider in their performance uh, metrics. So we're really trying to embed that at, at the core of, of what we do and, and the purpose around, you know, doing good in our communities and, and helping advance the sustainability agenda. That's wonderful. That's wonderful to hear. Um, Now, a recent study by the United Nations Global Compact and Accenture found that only 18% of CEOs said that governments and policymakers have given them the clarity needed to meet their sustainability and climate change targets. So what sorts of signals do you think governments need to send post COP26 to help fill this information gap and give companies what they need to have their 2030 target strategies aligned with the Paris Accords 1.5 degree Celsius ambitions. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for pointing out the research. It's, I think, the largest of its kind with um, over 1,200 CEOs around the world interviewed. It really is uh, an excellent piece of research that Peter Lacey and, and his team have led. And, and yes, as you said, 18% feel that. But let me start with what the CEOs want um, from policymakers and, and governments. You know, the first, no surprise, they they want concrete action around carbon pricing. Now, I think we've made progress through COP26 around Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. We're starting to get the broad framework, but it, uh, I think in what we hear is most CEOs want more clarity uh, in order to engage um, in, in, uh, in carbon trading. Uh, they also want as much clarity... Uh, as possible around ESG refor- reporting frameworks. Uh, no surprise there as well. They also want to make sure that we align all nationally determined contributions to the 1.5 degree trajectory to accelerate the decarbonization of the value chain. They want clarity in terms of the financing and the support for the global south and how businesses and governments are going to help. And they also want the government and to help with R&D research and development in, in the area of sustainability. And, and obviously, companies need to engage in R&D as well, but we know the government can play a key role there. Those are some of the things that, that CEOs have said that they, that they want. The other, one of the other things they say is they want more engagement by policymakers and governments with the business community. And when we ask the CEOs, only 30% of CEOs believe that the governments have an, uh, a good understanding of the business options. And so they want more engagement and more dialogue. Now, the flip side of that is I just, you know, as business leaders, we can hope and demand things from policymakers and government, but we also need to recognize we have our own accountability and responsibility that has to be carried through in parallel and not wait for the government. And so in the survey, 72% of CEOs agree that sustainability is an immediate priority. It sounds like a high number, but it implies 28% don't, which implies there's work to be done. 57% of CEOs are prioritizing uh, climate actions, but, you know, as part of their COVID recovery plan, but again, it implies 43% are not prioritizing climate action. 
And so there's work to be done. We can't just wait for policymakers. You know, another stat that are only 2% of climate targets by corporations are aligned, uh, aligned with science-based target initiative. That number is increasing, increasing fast, but it's not enough. And so, yes, we should and have to demand more from governments and policymakers, but as corporate leaders, we have to act and we cannot. Ju- we certainly cannot wait for these things to be clarified by governments and policymakers. Well, well said, well said. Um, now, COP26 President Alok Sharma noted in an address that gender and climate are profoundly intertwined and that the impacts of climate change affect women and girls disproportionately. Interestingly, Accenture has made a commitment to achieve a gender-balanced workforce by 2025. So why is this balance such a high priority for Accenture and how will having a gender-balanced workforce improve everything that Accenture does? Yeah, so, um, you know, first of all, it's it's an important point that was made because we know climate change, as you very well know, affects disadvantaged communities and affects communities that are more vulnerable more significantly. And that certainly applies to women and girls globally. The stat that says 80% of those displaced by climate-related events are women and girls. And so, so we certainly, you know, this is a very important lens as we look to address the climate challenge that's ahead of us. Uh, for us, as you said, we've made public goals around gender uh, equality by 2025. Uh, we have also made in the U.S., uh, and in a few other countries, public commitments around Black and African American yeah. employees to raise that to, from nine to twelve percent by 2025, and Hispanic American and Latinx employees from nine and a half to thirteen percent. So, a sixty percent increase in Black, African American, Hispanic American, and Latinx, uh, including doubling our managing directors by 2025. For, for us, I mean, you ask me why. First of all, it's the right thing to do. It's the only thing to do. We, it, you know, it, it just is the right thing to do. But we also look at, you know, you know, our, our business, we're, we're in the business of ideas and innovation, and you can only get the right ideas in the room if you have diversity of thought, which requires diversity of background, diversity of thinking, uh, the, the diversity of upbringing, diversity, you know, in all dimensions. And so uh, for us, it's a competitive uh, must. We have to embrace and we have to be aggressive about diversity. It is critical for business results. Turning the attention back to the environmental part of ESG or or even the social part of ESG, you're taking ESG as a whole, it turns out from COP26 that, you know, clearly the private sector will have to play a very, very large role uh, to kind of meet our commitments from reducing deforestation to cutting methane and, and everything else. So what do you think needs to change in the ESG measurement and disclosure space to enable more transparency for different stakeholders on companies' actions so that we tie companies' feet to their fire and ensure that progress is being made? Yeah, I think uh, we all know that the, the quote, what get, gets measured gets done. And so the ESG measurement improving in terms of the quality, materiality, consistency is critical. One of the things we saw as we, we surveyed over the last few months is that when we look at critical stakeholders for sustainability, financial investors have gone from the number eight most important stakeholder to, to number three. And all companies are realizing it. And actually, if you look at the participation of the financial services sector at COP26, very, very significant. And so when we look at ESG measurement, it has been a bit of an alphabet soup over the years, a a lot of different, uh, you know, standards and and, and so on in organizations. It's great to see running up to COP26 that the ISSB was starting to consolidate a lot of these standards. I think that will help with you know, consistency and quality. And I think we're heading towards uh, a place over the next few years where ESG measurement is as important and as looked at and as critical as financial measurement. And I think when we get to that level of parity, I think it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. I think some of the things we're starting to see are are heading in in the right direction. Uh, The other thing that we're going to need to see is, is going from data to analytics 
and this is where technology plays a key component. And I, I know you, when you spoke to Peter on one of your prior podcasts, you talk about our partnership with SAP and Salesforce. You know, the data and the analytics and how you process all of that is going to be critical. Just so companies run complex analytics around their financial data and operational data that yields insight and drives action. Um, you know, we need to head into the in, in the same direction with with the SG data. And I think uh, we're on a journey, but certainly some good progress made in the last few weeks. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, well, time flies when you're having fun, and our time is coming to a close. With COP26 in mind, and, and that's behind us now, but with that in mind, what, what call to action would you make to our listeners? Yeah, I mean, I think your uh, listeners are highly educated in, in the space of sustainability. And I don't need to tell them, but we are in the 11th hour or beyond the 11th hour. And we're at a point where to get to one and a half degree, almost every lever has to be pulled and has to be pulled now. You know, a few years ago, people talked about it. This is the problem that their great, great grandchildren are going to face. And I think people now understand this is the problem that our children are going to face. And maybe some of us will face as well, but certainly our children. It, It is now personal. It is now right in front of us. Right? We're talking about our kids facing a catastrophe if we don't act. And I think what we all need to realize is it's everyone's issue. Right? We cannot, there's nobody that's going to solve it for us. If we wait and, well, the government will solve this, or maybe the oil and gas industry will solve it, or the cement. No, it's everybody's issue. We all have to be in it. And as corporate leaders, we need to make sure it's not just a, a bolt on but it's built into the DNA of the organization. And so that, that to me, is the key thing. It, it is, it's going to take all of us. And CB, I, I started reading your book this weekend, which, you know, I think your title says it all, uh, Small Actions, Big Difference. It really is about all of us taking action. Uh, the time is, is now. Uh, it, it hasn't quite passed us, but the time is now to, to act. This is, uh, we don't have any more time to wait. Jack Azuguri, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for taking the time to participate in our podcast. CB, it's uh, been a, a great pleasure and uh, thank you for all you do. And uh, I'm going to continue to enjoy your podcasts. Uh, it's a great forum you've uh, pulled together. So thank you for having me. And before I sign off, I just want to say that this podcast is made possible with the help of my colleagues, Chris Gassman, who is Associate Director at the Center for Sustainable Business, and Sukanya Romianan, who is a Center Associate at the Center for Sustainable Business. I'm your host, Sibiu Haracharya, and I will see you in a couple of weeks for the next episode of Sustaining Sustainability. Mm-hmm.